Okay, so Dan, thank you for taking the time to talk to people at the University of Waterloo. I'm very grateful for you uh, doing this. Uh, you're, you've been in Victoria for a few years now, and uh, uh, and and you're uh, running the Economic Development uh, Technology Development Organization there. But I thought I would begin by asking you to introduce the students to Victoria. Most of them won't have been there. Uh, and uh, the main aspects of the local economy. Sure. So Victoria is pretty much as far west as you get in Canada. We're an island in the Pacific, we like to say. So, you know, the next island is Hawaii, uh, the west of us. And uh, we're about 90 kilometers um, southwest of Vancouver and about 90 kilometers northwest of Seattle. So there's a bit of a triangle that takes place there. Um, the population of our region in Greater Victoria is about 350,000. The South Island is about um, 450,000, just to give you an idea. The island itself is bigger than Belgium. Um, it takes six hours to drive from the South End to the, to the North End, but most of the population is concentrated in a 20 kilometer uh, radius uh, on the South Island. Uh, I moved here from Ontario, so I grew up on Lake Simcoe. And, uh, and why, the reason I'm here is I got off a plane in February and it was sunny out and I went golfing that day. And uh, that, that, really, uh, that really won me over. Uh, Victoria itself is often known uh, globally um, for famous things like the Empress Hotel, which is a famous old CP hotel here, even though the CP trail line, train line obviously didn't come to our island, they built, uh, built an old hotel here. And the Butchard Gardens, which is a very famous um, botanical uh, tourist attraction. Uh, so a lot of people have seen and heard those things. It's also a state capital. We're the seat of the provincial government. And so we have the legislature in downtown Victoria, which uh, has a big impact on our community. Tourism, we're close to 4 million visitors a year um, in, that come to, to Victoria. And I think New York City gets about 6 million tourist visitors a year. So that's a pretty interesting comparative. Uh, so our population really swells between February and October uh, when the weather is the nicest. Uh, we have two universities and a college, UVic, Royal Road University, and Camosun College. And we have 10 federal research facilities like the Hertzberg Institute of Astrophysics and the Pacific Institute of Sport Excellence. Um, and then we have a tech sector. And, and a lot of people don't see the tech sector because tech companies start here because people are attracted to the lifestyle. They want to live on an island in the Pacific but still stay in Canada. Uh, they go to universities and colleges here. Uh, if they're in a relationship, uh, their partner likely can have a good stable career in government or in education or in, uh, or in health. Um, and so there's many legs to our stool and they all are cross complementary. but tech is the largest industry in Victoria by a lot. It's about $4 billion a year. The last time we did an economic impact study in revenues of over $5 billion in economic impact. Uh, the tourism sector, uh, last I heard was just under 2 billion in economic impact. So, you know, call it two and a half times the size of tour tourism, which is a big surprise to a lot of people. Very diverse. You know, obviously we have a lot of, um, uh, you know, digital um, software related because those are the, have the lowest barriers to entry for starting a company. But we also have aerospace. We have a company called Viking Air that makes a, a new plane every 15 days and sells them around the world. We have Vancouver Island Helicopter. Uh, we have a company called Questor Tangent that makes um, one of the uh, most uh, sought after train rail safety systems. We don't even have a running train on the island. And they used to be an ocean sciences company. But one thing they figured out is if you can build things that work under the water, it's real easy to build things that work on a train. And so systems integration and, and that kind of engineering, advanced manufacturing um, are all popular. And because we're on an island, we don't. We do have some large manufacturers, Nicholson Manufacturing, for example. They build large forestry equipment. Um, but generally, if you're building a physical product, um, the, the saying is, you want it to be smaller than the size of your fist and sell for more than ten thousand uh, dollars. And then that it's then the shipping logistics are, are easy to handle and and the, and the margins are high enough. Um, and so it's very diverse and it's you know it's been thriving uh, as a community. Uh, for a very long time. My organization is called Viatech, which is the Victoria Innovation, Advanced Technology and Entrepreneurship Council. Uh, we've been around for 30 years and there are some tech companies here who have been around since the 50s. Um, big brands are coming here all the time. Amazon bought A Books, Snyder Electric bought Power Measurement. Just recently, EA Sports bought Metalhead Software, which is a gaming company. And so we're seeing you know, acquisitions um, coming to our shores all the time. And we have about uh, 17,000 people working in uh, tech careers in Greater Victoria and about 900 tech companies. 
Fascinating. And you mentioned Viatech, you're the CEO. Uh, can you just say what Viatech does? Sure. Well, Viatech's mission is to cultivate the most cohesive tech community in the world. We know that's lofty. We do that by um, providing um, shared uh, resources for the um, opportunities and challenges that are in common among our members. Uh, we want to provide a sense of belonging and shape our region. And so as the number one industry, we have a role to play in what our region is going to look like. A sense of belonging is really important. There's more and more evidence about how diversity uh, can enhance innovation and profitability of companies. And, and Victoria being an island community where people generally don't leave, there's a joke. When you uh, move to Vancouver Island, there's no bridge off the island, so you can't afford to burn one. And so people have a real strong holding of social capital uh, and, and building relationships in a very long-term view. And so our job is to help shepherd and direct those intentions among the tech companies um, to help the overall tech sector grow. We're very fortunate that um, the people who come here are very values-driven people. And as a result, they're very community-minded. And so their willingness to support and help each other is exceptional compared to a lot of other regions and cities around the world. And uh, we try and create the fun events and the valuable programs and services. We run an accelerator program. We own a co-working space uh, in downtown Victoria, 16,000 square foot um, uh, building with give or take 30 emerging tech companies in it. And uh, we're a not-for-profit that, um, that just lives to serve the needs and, uh, and opportunities of, of our members, which are the tech companies in Greater Victoria. So you're making a contribution to making Victoria uh, a better, it's already an excellent place to live, but you're making it even more excellent. For you, what is a good city to live in? What, as you make your contribution, what do you see the whole becoming really? Well, that's, I, I love that question because I think about that a lot. Economic development is not something I'm trained in, and it's not even a term I really knew until people started calling me that. Um, but uh, when I moved to Victoria, moving from um, Southern Ontario, there's a number of things. One, it just felt right to me, but I've later come to uh, come up with this term called a magnetic city. It's a combination of, like there's two poles, the quality of life and the quality of opportunity. And so in Victoria, there are some really amazing companies that you can work with that are doing really great and amazing things. And, you know, there's 10,000 hectares of land. There's hundreds of kilometers of bike trails. You know, kayaking after work in the Inner Harbor or around is, is, is an option. Uh, the lifestyle, the lifespan here is longer. You know, cycling capital of the world, romance capital, or cycling capital in Canada, romance capital in Canada, smartest city in Canada. Many accolades have been heaped upon the place. Um, but there's a difference between a gravity city and a magnetic city. And a gravity city is based on critical mass. You can pick New York, San Francisco, Toronto, Vancouver, um, Paris, London, many places. And they have so much critical mass that they just pull in everything based on their gravitational field. Anything around them gets pulled in. Um, and so you get a real mix of, dis uh, of disparate interests and, and, and goals and community mindedness. A magnetic city, which typically is less than a million people, um, has a great uh, education base, has great lifestyle, and generally, as a result, has a great innovation sector. Um, the people who choose that are people who can be anywhere in the world, and they're looking for making sure that 24 hours a day is great, not just uh, the 8 to 10 hours they spend uh, at work. And so uh, Victoria offers a lot for people who are looking for that. It's more popular than ever, which is a challenge. We're trying to build housing as fast as we can. Um, to, to accommodate the people who want to come here. And we want to grow smart. You know, it's, uh, it's 20 kilometers from my, my house to the front door of my office. And when I, people here think that's far, right? Uh, when I grew up in Ontario, if you had a 45 minute commute, you were, uh, you were considered lucky. And so um, people want to preserve all of those benefits of a small city, but with big ideas. And so since I've gotten here, I've been here now 22 years. And since I've gotten here, the thing that I think I've seen change the most is technology has gone from about 600 million in revenues to um, over 4 billion in revenues. And as a result, uh, the city's gotten younger, much more energy, much more innovative. And people here are fiercely loyal to community built things. And so uh, this is one of the only places I've ever been that I've seen in the downtown core close two McDonald's, a KFC, a Taco Bell. But at the same time, there's 26 independent coffee shops. There's more restaurants per capita in Victoria than anywhere else in North America other than San Francisco. 
um, and they're almost all local. People here really want to support their own ideas. Um, and, and I don't see that as often, you know, uh, we, because there isn't a major eight lane highway running right through the community, we don't have that same plaza, you know, here's the keg, here's the Walmart, here's the Montana's, here's the Kelsey's, there's the theater um, kind of build out that, that you would see in, in areas with larger populations. Um, and, and I don't know that they would do very well here because Victorians are like, if you go to a party in Victoria and you showed up with a, uh, a Budweiser uh, pack of beer versus something locally made, we have, I think 13, maybe it's 15 independent brewers now in the, on the South Island, the whole room, it would be like a record scratch. They'd be like, we have so many great things here. Why would you, why would you have that? And so I think that pride, um, and that commitment to the community is really special. And, I, and the tech sector has had a hand in making that economically feasible, right? So in economic development terms, there's something called the first dollar. And uh, so if you spend money over and over in a community, that's economic activity. But where did the first infusion come from? And in Victoria, it comes from um, students arriving and going to school here. It comes from tourists visiting here. But the most comes from the tech sector. And so with, uh, I think if I remember right, 85% of the revenues of our tech sector are from off the island. 60% of that's from the United States. Uh, all of those dollars coming here, they then get spent over and over and over again. And so there are studies that I think it was Stanford, maybe it was Harvard, one of those fancy Ivy League schools did a study and they found that for every one tech job in a community, it creates five other jobs. And I think that's highly visible in Victoria. You know, jobs pay well, um, and the people, uh, the people like to get out and support the community. And so, so there's a real economic engine that gets created by an innovation economy when there's the right places for them to gather and support. So the community has become more techno, or the local economies become more technology driven. The population has become younger. Uh, what do you see, uh, as the economic strengths today? Presumably technology would be one of them. Uh, and what would you see as the challenges that the community faces uh, at, at the moment? Uh, which areas are growing, which might be receding? Uh, how would you see that? Well, interesting times being coming right out of a pandemic, right? So there's a, there's a lot, of, a lot of indicators that are a little bit skewed right now. But if we kind of try and remove that overall, because we just don't know what's going to happen with tourism. For example, we have hundreds of cruise ships that dock here every year, and um, they haven't been for the last year, and, and they, they may not all return, right? So there could be some, you know, um, some uh, recovery uh, lagging um, for the tourism industry. But um, overall, when we look at it, what the strengths are, a lot of people want to be here, and it's a really nice place to be. Uh, and, you know, and having you know forty thousand post-secondary students out of three hundred fifty thousand people um, infuses a lot of innovative thinking, a lot of progressive mindedness, uh, a lot of entrepreneurial entrepreneurial vigor. Um, and so I think those are, you know those are all uh, inputs that are are making a a big difference. Um, the tech sector itself coming into its own and becoming known. Right. So now as EA just bought Metalhead Software and as these other Fortune 100 companies start looking at Victoria, it brings more capital, right, more investment capital, which is a challenge in Canada in general, uh, overall, uh, raising investment capital. So more of that. And then just more when, you know, at first, when people have never heard that you have a tech sector, it takes them a while to even consider it an opportunity. Right. So I wouldn't be surprised if many of the students that take the time to watch this will be will have had no idea that there was opportunities uh, in Victoria. And they would never have considered it because even though we are, uh, according to um, a CBRE, which is a, a commercial real estate firm, we are the, the, uh, the seventh um, largest um, tech uh, city in Canada. A lot of people aren't hearing that story on a regular basis. And, uh, and so, so that, that can slow things down. And I think things that are holding us back are not unique to Victoria except that we do have um we have a limitation that others don't have which is land right so we do have ten thousand hectares of parkland but it's not like the island's getting any bigger and so where are we going to put more people what are we going to build for them and how are we going to keep it affordable um is an issue here uh and that's an issue i mean barry ontario right now you know 40 percent increase in, in housing prices most recently and uh you know hamilton recently has seen a big surge um, and so this is happening everywhere um, but of course, we want to outperform those places because uh, we want to attract the really talented people to come live in paradise with us. <laughs> sure. The uh, 
to turn it just a little bit uh, from the tech sector itself towards technology change in the community generally, how is that impacting the Victoria economy? You know, as businesses are more impacted mm -hmm. by technology themselves, whatever sector they might be in, and how is that impacting the lives of people there? Uh, I think of, you know, automation, perhaps, the uh, uh, perhaps uh, changes in people's retail behavior. What sort of, uh, you know, how is technology impacting people in the community? Mm, I like that question. P Peter, I just need two minutes to step away from the screen to help my wife with something and I'll be right back, okay? And sure. I'll answer that question right away. Sorry about that. No problem. When, you, when you're recording again. I switched it back on, so if you want to go ahead. Uh, sure. Well, the question about like, what are the overall impacts that, on society or in our community? Um, I love podcasts, so I feel like this is like a question for Freakonomics or 99% Invisible or, or one of the others. But, you know, some of the things that we're seeing, and I think the pandemic actually is quite informative in this. Uh, you know, the tech sector in Victoria, when the pandemic started, we started surveying right away our membership saying, you know, what are the impacts? What are you worried about? We found that um, the ability for them to flip to um, remote was much easier than almost any other sector, probably than any other sector. Um, and so it was pretty much overnight when people decided, okay, we're not going to the office anymore. It was everybody closed their laptop, took it home, dialed in, and they used Slack and whatever um, uh, video uh, conferencing platform quickly. And we saw that for them, you know, it was only in, you know, it was less than uh, less than 10 percent that were that said that if the lockdown continued for more than a year, they would struggle to um, to continue to uh, to, to thrive and, and grow. Uh, but overall, most of the companies were actually grew through the pandemic. And I, I tell that story not because your question is about the tech sector, but about, you know, if, 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 if technology is typically on the front edge of adoption of, of innovation, then it, what it demonstrated was just how powerful and transformative these tools could be. And, and, and you know, we own our building downtown. It's called Fort Tectoria. It's a four, five story building. And, um, and it's, you know, full of early stage companies. And, it, you know, at, at the worst in the pandemic, it got down to maybe 50% occupied, which is, which is the, the difference, just to give you a sense, is we normally have a wait list that almost would fill a second building, right? So it was a pretty sizable where people didn't want to be around people. We're starting to see that come back now where more and more people are signing um, lease agreements or co-working agreements to move back in, some right away, some this September, right? So we're a few months away from that. Um, but I think the big thing that we're seeing that um, a lot of people, I think were taken uh, by surprise is the larger companies are now looking at co-working options. So it used to be, you know, co-working was for a company of like 15 people or less. And then you kind of grew up, you moved out of dad's basement and you got your, your own place, right? Um, and uh, now what we're seeing is companies that have 70 staff are saying, we're not expecting to have more than 35 on site at any given time, maybe less. And so what's a co-working opportunity for us? And what I think is really going to be exciting about that is um, if like the great thing about a co-working space can, is, is that you're bringing, say, 30 companies together and they're all kind of pushing each other, cheering each other on. They're, they're you know, they're, they're problem solving together. They're uh, motivating each other, which is great. But if you can infuse, you know, a more established, experienced company, then you're, the mentorship and the um, and the examples are going to be different. And I think that that's going to lead to the emerging companies maturing at a faster rate and seeing uh, what that looks like. And so overall, I think communities right now, you know, partly due to technology and innovation, partly due to the pandemic opening some eyes, you know, the commercial real estate um, in, in any city is in a greater state of flex than ever. I'll tell you that um, if I can find the right other building, I'll buy another one because I am confident that our model of a co-working space, which keep, like we have a big lounge downstairs, we have our own coffee shop. And so just always a hive of activity, right? It's kind of like a, I don't want to use the campus model because you know that can have too academic a, 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 a sense for people, but, um, but you, you know, you're trying to create this, this hive of activity. Um, and we will, do, we will do more of that. I think 
the other thing is, is the type of opportunities um, that are available. You know, the upward mobility of careers, I think, is greatly influenced by, by tech. Um, and I think as a result, that puts pressure on all other all other factors in the in the economy. So one of the things I definitely hear from you know people in the uh, the tech side of, of government or universities is that you know they it's hard for them to find people that are of good quality that are willing to work for the compensation they're willing to offer. And I think that's because they're getting dragged up, like things are getting pulled up by by the tech sector. And I think that overall that's that that's good for a community. Of course, you got every organization's got to manage itself. Um, I think the other thing with technology is we ran a pro we're running a program um, we're re firing it back up for another four months um, with uh, digital emergency response recovery response something and recovery there was uh, resilience response recovery and resilience um, so dur three I didn't love the name but uh, uh, it was specifically us taking people who know a lot about digital presence, online presence, and working with bricks and mortar businesses, working with bookshops, working with cafes, working with restaurants, working whatever, and helping them do an audit of like, well, what do you, like right now you have time because you're not as busy and people are doing more online. Are you showing up online? Are you using the right tools? Can your customers get what they need? Because you need that. Otherwise, Amazon's just going to get all the business. And so, you know, I think uh, those technological tools are becoming um, more um, understood and adopted by all factors of the economy itself. Um, and, and I think that's going to lead to um, uh, margin gains or price reductions, and it's going to lead to convenience gains um, overall for the community. Uh, and so I think that's good. I think the important thing is, is that tech people need to realize that they have more stability, security, and abundance um, based on based on their education and their hard work and their experience. They've earned it, but there's a role for you to play in your community when you're doing better than the rest of your community. Um, and so we have something called the Vitech Foundation where we raise money every year and we direct it towards you know certain things in the community as a way of showing our our, our tech sector how to be philanthropic. Um, and then, you know, and also making sure the rest of the, the community sees that the tech sector is uh, is a supporter uh, and a contributor to the overall economy and, and, and generous. And so um, I think it, it allows, the t you know, having a thriving innovation sector and new innovative tools are making all businesses more adaptable and resilient. Um, they're bringing more economic opportunity when things are done right, and hopefully enough community mindedness that they're they're giving back um, to the to the community so that the rising tide can bring up all the boats. So I, what I'm hearing, uh, and, and I think it's very interesting, is that uh, remote working, co-working, more flexible work arrangements are creating more vibrancy, flexibility, innovation uh, in, your, in the, the areas that you can see uh, in your organization and you're looking more broadly too. But you're basically saying that the shift away from going to work every day or, or from the more rigid organizational forms that existed before uh, is a positive one uh, as far as uh, organizations becoming more innovative and uh, the quality of life improving for people in the community. On the whole, that's true. There are some challenges. Um, you know, maintaining uh, and building a strong culture with a disparate and uh, remote workforce is much more difficult. It's something that is more and more becoming apparent. Um, to companies and so that's something that's why the co-working model for larger companies i think is going to be such a natural marriage because they still want to have a place to gather they still want a place where people can feel that they're a part of something like you know there's office space and then there's office places um and so just a space who cares but a place where you feel you get energy you get friendship you get camaraderie you get you know esprit de corps those things are all important and so um there's going to be some form of hybrid approach. The other thing that's interesting too is, um, you know, what's the impact going to be long term on now? Victorian companies are like, hey, I can't find, you know, the full stack developer that I wanted um, with the right experience set here, and moving somebody here, the recruitment process is expensive and uh, the cost. But now what I can do is I can hire one in Waterloo, and uh, work with them for six months. And once things start taking off, you know, now we're all a little bit more comfortable. We've we've dated for a while. 
maybe we can move in together, you know, and then uh, and, and, and make something um, uh, make make it make a stronger connection and vice versa. You know, the thing that we're watching uh, with some trepidation is, you know, our greatest talent. Are they all going to start working for bigger paychecks from uh, from Google um, or Twitter or Facebook? Um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Of course, they're going to bring those dollars into our community. They're going to spend them. They're going to get great relationships and experiences. And hopefully at some point they're going to recognize, I want to do my own thing. I want to be part of something that I have more influence over. And then they can become a part of, uh, of one of our companies. And so I see the silver lining in all of the options, but there's definitely going to be, you know, some, uh, some challenges along the way and some adaptation. And I don't know exactly what the model is going to be, but I don't think fully virtual and is, is an option anymore. And I don't think that fully uh, in office is an option anymore. There's going to be some hybrid. Are you in two days a week, three days a week, one day? You know, what's that going to be? Um, and so that's going to be interesting to watch play out. It's going to take a couple of years for the, you know, the best practices to be discovered. Uh, but I know at the beginning of the pandemic, there are a lot of people thinking we might not ever have an office again. I don't hear that as much as I used to. So you're saying that on the one hand, uh, businesses can employ people who are physically some a long way away. Uh, but at the same time, people can do jobs for companies that are a long way away, like Google and others. So they could work in Waterloo and sorry, live in Waterloo and work in Victoria, but they can live in Victoria and work for Google uh, in yeah. you know in San Francisco or whatever. So uh, uh, overall, as far as the skills needs uh, go for companies in Victoria. Uh, how are they doing with that? Uh, and, you know, how does that impact economic development? Mm. Yeah, so there, are, there you know, there will be times where certain, like, we'll, we have a job board at biotech.ca. Yesterday, we had 104 jobs on it. I don't know. I haven't looked at it today. Um, and every once in a while, I'll do an analysis, see what's coming up over and over again. But that is a moving target. Right. And so I, I get this a lot from universities and colleges where we're on advisory panels and they're trying to decide on curriculum. And they'll be like, you know, what do we need next? And, and I'll say, how long will it take you to develop whatever I tell you? And they're like, well, it usually takes like three years to get approval and four or five years to get it off the ground. I'm like, whatever my answer is today, it won't be the right answer in four to five years because it's moving, right? And when you start talking about that very applied, like whether or not it's, you know, iOS or if it's a certain, you know, if it's machine learning AI or if you're getting right into, you know, one language, um, it's always moving. Uh, and so really what we advise people who want to work in, in the tech sector, if they want to be, a, you know, a highly sought after candidate, of course, you have to specialize and uh, and know, you know, some hard skills, some applied skills. The difference maker is which ones are good at communicating, which ones are good at uh, cooperation, collaboration, which ones are good team members. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's easy for somebody. Well, it's common. I maybe it's not, it, it must be easy too, but it's common for somebody like, you know, say if you're an in, at engineering at Waterloo, I mean, you know, you're, you have a 95% average. Um, you've probably been the smartest person around that you've been around most of your life. Um, and so it's common to feel that way, uh, 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 feel like, well, I know more and I, I can do more and, and et cetera. And I understand where that comes from. That doesn't make the best team member. That doesn't make the best employee. That doesn't make the best leader. Right. The best leader isn't the one who thinks they know the most or the one who knows they don't know the most and they hire the people to fill in what they need to, to be that complement. And so working on, you know, that team building, that communications, I don't know how much teamwork there is in engineering. There's a lot in my business degree and students hated it because you always had a few, you know, dullards and laggards that you were paired with that you felt like you were carrying along the way. And people were like, well, if this is the real world, I just they'd just be fired. But firing people is not as easy as you think. Um, and, uh, and, you know, so how do you motivate, how do you find commonality and how do you bring people together? That kind of stuff stands out. And in addition to the applied skills, what evidence is there that you're, uh, that you are the kind of person who just takes stuff on, right? So people love to see that. So I was at, you know, I was in this program, I did comp sci here or, or there on the side, you know, I worked with this not for profit and I built them a system that does this, or. I was really into this gaming platform. And so I developed, you know, my, using that game engine, I built my own thing. People who show that sort of independent self-motivation um, are highly sought after as well. And the evidence of that is who's doing more than going to class. Because uh, I'll be honest, I rarely hear anybody say, where'd you go to school and what was your GPA? In fact, 
I don't think I've heard that in 15 years. Um, and so the thing that you've been evaluated on, the thing that you've been validated against, the thing that's managed your self-esteem for so long isn't really as valuable as you think uh, when you get on the real world. It's, it's are, are, are you fun? Are you nice? Are you capable? Do you pick things up on your own? Are you conscientious? You know, do you, tell you, do you leave loose ends or you to tie things up? That kind of stuff. The good character qualities um, are the things that, they, that really separate people. Um, and the best evidence of that is what you do beyond school. And, you know, whether or not you're volunteering or you're, you're diving into a hobby and it doesn't have to be related to your career. You know, I think the thing that people find people remember and find most interesting about me is more about like me building kayaks and building art cars for Burning Man than anything to do with my my actual business career. Um, and those things have taught me a great deal about project management um, and skill set, patience, you know, education, learning. Um, uh, consulting with uh, experienced people, all these different things along the way. And so um, the, the flavor of the day will always be changing, um, but the, you know, they call it the soft skills. And I hate that term because it's the relatable skills. It's the stuff that makes you a human. It's the stuff that makes people want to be around you. Um, that's great. Great, uh, very good advice. I hope the people who are watching it list, uh, will, will consider it very carefully. Um, as far as uh, Victoria is concerned, uh, the changes that the community are experiencing at the moment, uh, what sort of government support uh, for economic development do you think is important? What is the role of government in the time that we're now going through? Yeah, you know, this is an interesting question because, I mean, Viatech as an organization, our budget is generally around $2 million a year. And um, let's see, 40% of that will come from government sources. Um, and so obviously I think that's important. They fund our accelerator program primarily um, and our leadership training. So there are some things that um, young companies and experienced companies need, but the business, the business case isn't really there um, to make a for-profit model around that, right? And so uh, I'll give you an example. There are definitely for-profit um, accelerators out there and some of them are excellent they are limited in who they accept and who can get in. That doesn't mean that the people who didn't get in didn't have um, a great idea or they maybe they have a bad idea, but they're gonna be a great entrepreneur. And so by having the support of government, we're able to offer a very wide funnel for our accelerator program of who we consider and who we bring in. And that means that um, people who may not have the right check boxes for a for-profit accelerator will get into our program they will meet people that they're gonna end up founding companies with. They're going to learn skills that they're forever gonna use and determining, you know, the best thing I think, uh, one of the best things you can offer, we do this market validation training and it's all about value proposition. It's on the lean business canvas model. You, if you're in tech, you're gonna hear these terms all the time. And really one of the things that's great about it is if you do a good job learning our market validation course, you'll know you have a bad idea by the time you're done. And, and that's good because you can self-select to kill the idea because nobody likes to be told they have an ugly baby. Um, but if they can realize on their own, this just really doesn't have the legs to go anywhere. At best, it's gonna be a lifestyle business. They can then take the skills they were taught in a, in a program that was government funded and apply it to every idea they have again. And so now they're gonna go through their ideas quicker and then they're gonna be like, no, wait, this one finally does check the boxes for something that's gonna take them further. And so that skills development stuff is, is important and will not be done um, without some government support. Um, there's also uh, IRAP, the Innovative Research, uh, Innovation and Research Assistance Program, which is a, is a supportive program for R&D activities. There's SHRED, the Scientific Research and Experimental Development Tax Credit, which is a rebate on when you spend money on certain R&D. There are mixed opinions about the value and the impact of those programs, but they do help companies um, get through some of that R&D phase without um, giving up a lot of equity um, to venture capital while they're, while they're proving their prototype. And so I, I, I think there's merit in that. Um, there are you know, programs that incentivize um, hiring, you know, like hiring of students, hiring of diversity are good things because they make it easier for a company to take a chance where they normally wouldn't. And once they've taken a chance and it goes well, then it becomes natural and ingrained inside of them. So incentivizing you know, good behavior can ingrain good behavior in the long term when it goes well. But you know, as far as like on the ec economic development front, if I have somebody say, hey, I've got a company and I'm thinking about moving it, I'm, I'm considering Victoria, Vancouver, 
you know, rally North Carolina and um, Atlanta, you know, what tax incentives will you give me to move my company there? I'm not very excited about the, the opportunity because it's a nomadic behavior. It, 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 if you're willing to move for a tax incentive, then when that tax incentive expires, you're going to move somewhere else. And we've seen this happen where tax incentives are given for 10 years, companies move. And as soon as that's over, somebody else offers it. A, b- a better example is in the entertainment industry. You know, so filmmaking, digital media tax credits. We offer them here in BC. I know they offer them in, um, in Quebec. I'm sure they offer them in other parts of Canada. Um, but you watch the movie industry move from place to place every 10 years based on these tax incentives. It's not a long-term um, investment by them. It's, um, it's selfish nomadic behavior. And I don't think that it really brings a long-term benefit. Uh, and so instead it's like, here, why don't you come and visit? We're gonna show you why you wanna be a part of this community. And there are advantages, but I don't think they should come in the form of tax incentives. And so generally I get asked this question by politicians that are running for office all the time. And I say, you know, if you if you provide us clean, safe, healthy communities, you know, good transportation, good infrastructure, the tech sector will be fine. You know, it's not like we need you to get in there uh, too too much. Now we have a new fund that's just been announced, a five hundred million dollar new venture fund that's been announced by the province of British Columbia. That's going to be really exciting to see what difference that makes, because what that can do is attract capital from outside of the of the jurisdiction right so if um if i'm a if i'm a venture capitalist uh in the valley me considering canadian companies is you know it's a real stretch but if i'm like oh this has already been invested in and i'm i'm like i'm the last 10 percent um i'm not you know so i'm not i'm not having to carry the load um or they've already had a few rounds of investment and they've hit their marks and they've hit you know they're hitting their milestones they're proven It'll be interesting to see if that 500 million can apply a significant multiplier of added uh, investment capital from outside the region. And so I think those experiments are important um, and uh, and I think they have mixed results, but that doesn't mean you stop trying. I'm going to try and squeeze in just two more questions. Uh, okay. the, uh, the first one is, how is Victoria going to be different, if it is, after COVID from what it was before COVID? Well, so this is a very interesting week to get asked that question because Bonnie Henry, she's our, our, our public health officer, widely respected, adored by many. Uh, on what day was it? Was it Tuesday? Uh, she announced what our reopening timeline is based on vaccine schedules, cases, and hospitalizations. It's a, it's a brilliantly laid out, clear thing. And it you know basically says by July 1st, we're gonna be able to have as many people we want as our house, as many outdoor gatherings as we want. And by, by September, like concerts and sporting events are back on. Um, And the elation, the enthusiasm, the celebration was palpable. Even though you weren't around people, my phone, text after text, you know, messages, people were just so excited. And so I think it's gonna be, you know, I think it's gonna be a second roaring 20s in Victoria. And I I expect that's gonna be in a lot of places. Victorians love to go out and socialize. They love live music. They love arts and culture. Um, And that has been dormant and latent um and so hopefully enough of the energy and momentum survived because the demand is going to be exceptional and so i think post covid is going to be a really exciting i think it's just going to be a renewed um enthusiasm excitement um and appreciation for all the things that we were denied and so uh, i'm quite excited so it will be a more vibrant stronger community after covid than it was before not that it wasn't strong before but it will be even stronger after you think yeah I do. And I think, I mean, you start to take things for granted and, and then all you need is a little bit of scarcity for you to go, oh, I, I, I appreciate that much more now that I don't have it. And so I think that little, little, well, maybe it's a lot, but you know, a year and a half of being denied those things has reminded people um, how much, uh, how much they love and want those things. Okay. Last question. Uh, the people who are watching this are at the beginning of their careers. They're going to be going off to work in the not too distant future. Uh, what final words of advice that you might like to give them? You gave them a lot of good advice uh, around uh, around work and what would make them valuable, what companies would value about them. Uh, but any advice that you would have for someone leaving university today to go to work? Yeah, I think um, uh, you're obviously brilliant, right? You're in an amazing program and, and you've done well. 
um, you have focused so hard on your schoolwork that you haven't maybe looked around as much as, as you could have. And um, because your head's been down. And when you have had time, you've probably been in an insular group of the same people for four years that you've been hanging out with. And those are gonna be friends for the rest of your life. But I wanna warn you about something called compounded fiction, which is everybody says. And that's when one person says confidently, there's no jobs in this or at that place, or there's no future in that. And they say it enough times that other people hear it and then other people say it, even though they didn't do any research or investigation of their own. And then it becomes just accepted by your community that this is true, right? I've seen that happen where like the only opportunities are here or the only type of job you can get is that. None of that is true. You're all unique um, and you all have unique opportunities in front of you. You've got to do your own research and you've got to think for yourself. So you've learned how to learn, but make sure you stay critical in your thinking and you, and you look at things carefully on your own. It takes more work, but you'll have a better life if you don't just accept what everybody tells you is true. Wonderful. Uh, thank you, Dan, for talking to me today. Uh, I, I found our discussion stimulating, and I know it's going to be valuable to the people who watch it. Anybody who's still watching, my email address is dgunn, D-G-U-N-N, at viatech, V-I-A-T-E-C dot C-A. If you stuck it through and watch this whole thing, you've already shown some uh, some character. Um, and uh, I'd love to hear from you. Let me know what you're looking for. And if I have any connections that can open doors for you, I'd be happy to help. Thank you, Dan. Thanks, Peter.